Hello, I'm Mark Bailey, and I am the artistic director of the American Baroque Orchestra, which is a group I co-founded about nine years ago. And I am a conductor, but also a Baroque violist, and I'm the director of the Yale Collection of Historical Sound Recordings. Um, but I think especially pertinent to our discussion today, I teach conducting now as well, and I run the choral conducting program at the Gracias uh, Music School, which is part of the Mahanaim School, uh, a conservatory for uh, collegiate or undergraduate music students in New York on Long Island. Fantastic. So you're, as I know, um, a musician um, and an artist of many hats so to speak, and as I know you, uh, my name's Kevin Sherwinden. I began working with Mark Bailey um, in 2013. Can you believe that, Mark? Basically, no. Yeah, 2013, beginning of my freshman year at Yale, um, and began studying, conducting privately with him, and then uh, was his assistant with the Yale Russian Chorus, and mm -hmm. then um, began working with the American Baroque Orchestra um, as associate director. And so um, I know Mark as a musician and an artist of many, many hats. Um, but the interesting thing that has influenced me quite a bit is that it's not that he does many things, but rather that he's a conductor and an artist first and foremost, and then as a result of the kind of musician that he is, uh, that manifests in many different ways. And I think that's a very important thing for any artist, which leads us into our conversation for today, um, as it pertains specifically to conducting, um, is that, well, what does a conductor do? And, and more importantly, what does a conductor have to be able to do before even stepping foot on the podium? Well, as a preface to that, I, I just want to acknowledge the, the many hats comment uh, because that's relevant. Uh, it's, it's truly significant to uh, what I do as a conductor and how I teach conducting. It's something I was always inclined toward anyway, and I, I don't think that's uh, out of the ordinary for many musicians who wind up conducting that as children they're exploring many avenues of music as I did opera and viola and piano and a bit of competition uh, composition and and even ballet which becomes an important part of this at some point um, all that was going on but there was a, a really significant point in my conducting studies where this was acknowledged and I sort of em embraced this as an ideal and it was one summer at the Conductors Institute when uh, we all had the wonderful pleasure of, of studying with Dan Lewis you know, one of the great conducting teachers of all time um, who joined us in the final week and he gave a presentation and in that presentation uh, said something that you know, I just almost jumped out of my seat. I was so excited about, and um, he was saying, don't be a conductor who's a musician, be a musician who conducts. Uh, in other words, first and foremost, we're called to be musicians and explorers of music. Um, and then one of the things we can do is conduct and then conduct, you know, based on that exploration exploration, combining all the knowledge and excitement we get from everything we do and bringing that to the podium. Um, so I just wanted to say that as a little bit of, of background. Uh, thanks to Dan Lewis, who's no longer with us, um, and of course the wonderful teaching that he gave us that week, that particular model solidified in my mind something I think is very important. If one is trying to be a conductor solely and using music to serve that purpose, I think it, it leads to things that are limited and even problematic. 
if we are musicians, and again, one of the things we do, even the primary thing we do is conduct, um, that provides so many wonderful resources to make it an exciting experience uh, for all concerned, potentially. That's what we strive for. Using this formula of a musician who conducts um, rather than a conductor who's, who's also a musician um, is not to imply though that at some point you just get on the podium and wave your arms and it's sufficient because I know too many people who do that and uh, I don't think they bring enough to the craft. Uh, a musician who conducts still studies conducting very seriously and thoroughly and makes conducting technique the art of nonverbal communication, in other words, um, a priority. Um, so being a musician who conducts does require an intensive, thorough, ongoing study of the art of conducting, and I'd say even in a sense beginning with the art of conducting technique because all that musicianship, um, all that knowledge and skill gained from the broader experience of music has to be focused into the gestures. Um, and those gestures have to be able to uh, process and communicate and connect with the musicians uh, to allow a, a really vibrant form of musical exploration and expression to happen through the art of conducting. So I wanted to be very clear that, um, again, being a musician who also conducts does require studying the art of conducting technique incredibly thoroughly. Um, but with that said, going to the, the question of, you know, what do you have to have before you step onto the podium to conduct? Um, I'm going to say something that might even seem a little unexpected or contradictory uh, because I think besides an insatiable attraction to music and involvement in music, I think to get onto the podium and conduct, you don't have to do much else. Just get up there and do it. Mm -hmm. Just start doing it because it's, it's something in which physical gesture has to be uh, an organic part of thinking about feeling and expressing music from the beginning as a conductor. And uh, what I want to see is I want to see how the person moves on the podium. Um, I'm not primarily concerned with how, uh, you know, well developed the person's, you know, musical ability to solfege in any complex key or all of those skills that can be attained through study, um, I don't think, as some other conducting teachers do, that those all need to be in place first before you even raise your arm for an upbeat. Um, again, I think one has to be engaged in music already, seriously. One has to have an insatiable you know, curiosity and involvement with it. Um, but I want to see those musical skills develop alongside the physical skills. I want to see how the person looks on the podium uh, and gets and see how that person just responds to sound and tries to lead sound through physical gesture. Because if that's not going to work, then there are other things to do. Mm. So that needs to be there. Um, from the minute someone is inclined to be a conductor, I just want to see what that's going to look like and how we can work together and shape that and consider gesture and learn, uh, learn to dance on that podium in a beautiful way um, that serves the music rather than distracts from it or uh, in no way limits it. So do you think if someone say who's a teenager, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't have a natural inclination towards physical movement that they can't conduct or are there other activities that they can do such as ballet yeah, yeah, to that's... develop that pre-baseline before then trying to apply movement to conducting because 
you know, it's like there's a sense of isolation in the training that mm -hmm. as a conductor you need to be able to move to music and that the music right. can actually make the movement more difficult So if you're not natural with movement. So maybe you just need to go work on movement first and then pair it with music. Yeah, well, I think dance is important because music's an element of dance. Yeah. Um, so not to oversimplify it, but what I've seen is there are people who um, move kind of naturally and gracefully and in a compelling way uh, in terms of music, and that is certainly a pleasure to work with in conductors and there's some who don't have that gift mm -hmm. uh, necessarily um, but it's in that case it's a it's a matter of strategy mm -hmm. if if they don't have that particular gift then you figure out how they can get it um, i think in either case anyone who wants to conduct i highly recommend taking dance um, especially ballet and i did that in junior high and high school um, not because of conducting but because at that point, I was hoping to become an opera singer, and it was suggested to me that if I took ballet, I would move better on stage, yeah. and I'd have a better sense of how to navigate the stage, how to use my body on stage, uh, and how to express through gesture what, what I was singing. And I thought that was great, so I, I took ballet. But as it turns out, it is probably the single most important thing I did for myself to prepare for a conducting career because although we think of ballet and other forms of dance you know as using your legs and feet you use your arms quite a bit uh, port de bras and you learn how to carry your arms and move your arms um, slowly and quickly from various one position to another uh, and you do it according to music and according to choreography and that's not so different from what we do as conductors. Mm -hmm. um, but you learn you learn that muscle control. You learn how the arms work, how the head works, how the and you learn posture, which is also very important. Uh, so many conductors are doing kind of ridiculous things with their posture and uh, using almost contortions to indicate things that they could uh, otherwise indicate through a simple and graceful and elegant arm gesture. So either way whether the conductor has a natural gift for movement or not uh, I think ballet especially because that's what I know but uh, maybe a modern dance and some other forms of dance as well body movement awareness is essential uh, for it and uh, certainly I I rely on that experience every time I'm in front of an ensemble so you place a big emphasis in conducting on movement, which okay. makes sense because the conductor is up there moving right. to the music. But I've heard many conductors say that what you gesture up there doesn't matter, it's about how you rehearse. You know, how would you respond to that? Like a conductor who says, no, you make all the changes with the orchestra, you make all the suggestions with the orchestra in rehearsal, and then the performance just does what happened. In rehearsal, how would you respond? To Luckily, that? I haven't encountered many people who say that lately because I'd probably still be engaged in an argument with them huh. over that. Um, I think precisely, re I mean, rehearsal technique, of course, is incredibly important, and I had some wonderful teachers um, who helped me learn that art as well. But honestly, a conducting technique is to try. Uh, should reduce the amount of rehearsal time as much as possible mm -hmm. um, which by the way is more efficient you don't have to explain many things if the ensemble can clearly uh, read what's going on also if you have to explain everything in in rehearsal then you're committing to something and trying to replicate it exactly in the performance um, that can be a large component of it. And I'm a big believer in not using performances as a replication simply of what was done in rehearsal, but using the rehearsal to free up any and remove any impediments uh, that could be in the way toward a wonderfully in the moment uh, performance. Uh, and you can have a more in the moment performance with confidence if the nonverbal gestures you're using at the time are clear 
and legible to the players, and they know how to respond. So it opens up spontaneity. In it, music it absolutely making, does. Which the audience certainly appreciates. Yeah, so mm-hmm. rehearsals are really important for removing the impediments, and that's when you speak. And, removing and, the impediments. Could right. you talk about that more? Yeah, it's a, when there's a, a technical problem, a, a, maybe a Boeing issue, maybe there's a moment that uh, you know, you're trying to find the best way for the ensemble, whether it's choir, orchestra, uh, or the two in combination, to be able to express um, something with certain technical components and have to work that out. That's what you do in rehearsal. You make it, you free up all the musicians so that when we encounter that in performance, it's not going to be an issue uh, that holds us back or is limited. Um, And that could take some talking, and that can take some strategizing, and that can take some working. But to indicate, you know, we're going to go faster here, we're going to go slow down here, this is going to be a little louder, this is going to be articulated in a certain uh, way, at a certain dynamic, uh, none of that needs to be pre-planned or explained in rehearsal. Uh, that can all be done through gesture. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, and that's what I teach, that that can all be done through gesture. Yeah. I think that makes sense. Music's primarily a nonverbal language right. of communication. And, you know, in its essence, physical gesture, a visual for the players, communicates details of music making more effectively than trying to describe it in words for them to enact at a, a different point in time. You know? Right. Well, and I, I also think it's, for me, I try to lead in a very collaborative way. And uh, when I am conducting in a performance, say, I'm listening very carefully to how the musicians are uh performing, how they're playing or singing in the moment, what they're inclined to do, and it's my job to coordinate that uh, and, and, and make that a, a kind of cohesive form of expression, but it doesn't have to be a predetermined form of expression. Yeah. Again, which is something I'm afraid of in a rehearsal when you, know, you plot out exactly where that crescendo is going to begin and where it's going to end, and exactly what and dynamic it never and happens that way and, in any way. And, and, and trying to force yeah. it to happen yeah. creates, I think, a very conservative and often very stiff interpretation, or one that is, is just kind of lifeless. Yeah. Um, but I'm listening to what, what they're doing at that time, and I'm feeling the, the rea- reaction of the audience um, and making some decisions. and. I can't speak to them while I'm doing that, right? In a performance, so all I have are my gestures. Absolutely. Uh, but I can say it's it's one of the most exciting things about conducting when everyone is, is able to perform that piece uh, in that moment with that certain extra, spe- extra special vitality that only comes when you have the audience there in that space, in that particular time of day, under those circumstances. I love that. I love that. So to summarize that point, the movement studies, which you mm-hmm, recommend mm-hmm. studying ballet and dance, um, are necessary to having that kind of flexibility, versatility, and spontaneity right. as a conductor. It's essential. There's no other way to do it. It, it, you know? it totally is. Yeah. And it's true that when you study ballet, it is choreographed. There'll be a teacher who gives you um, a, a choreography, gives uh, some sort of routine to do, and you follow it. But it, it, th- that's not limiting at all. That's just part of the training, and we all do that in training. We, st- we do etudes and, and things like that, and we have exercises we follow. Um, but it, if, it has impact on just the way you move all the time. You move through life, mm-hmm. and because your body just works differently. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty easy often to identify a professional dancer walking down the street, right? Mm-hmm. It's their posture, their movement, the way they carry themselves, all that sort of thing. Um, it becomes who they are. It's not just how they look in the dance studio. Mm-hmm. So um, this becomes, a, again, a part of how the conductor moves and gestures and is on the podium in a very natural way as all uh, as well. Um, I think for young conductors, I will say, and, and 
this maybe goes off in a slightly different direction. I think to an extent doing some pre-planning of gestures is very helpful. Sure. Yeah. I did that when I was young um, and that's following the work I did with Harold Farben for instance. Um, I would, my scores from, I don't know what, 25, 30 years ago, whatever we'll have, uh, little circles drawn in or little symbols that would remind me that I thought a certain type of stroke, a certain sort of gesture would work best in this particular circumstances. And it helped me as I was getting used to conducting at that level. Um, and sometimes I would have to change that, of course, because the musical circumstances in the time dictated a different sort of gesture. Uh, I don't do that very much anymore because now it's really... Uh, all this is a comfortable and very familiar part of my vocabulary, uh, my gestural vocabulary as a conductor. So um, just like uh, a great orator who's able to give a wonderful and compelling speech just at a moment's notice without having to write it down ahead of time, that's eventually what will happen to a conductor. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I know that you also were trained. Mm -hmm as an operatic singer. Yeah. How did that influence and support your development as a conductor? That's a great question that no one has ever asked me before. Um, of the many things I was involved in musically as a student, which included piano and viola and some composition, as mentioned, and uh, being in the living room of my childhood home, which has big cathedral ceilings and a little balcony, having the stereo on the balcony, and pretending I was in the opera pit mm -hmm. conducting mm -hmm. as I'd put on recordings of Traviata, Bohème, and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so pretending to be a conductor, even back then. Uh, I came down on the side of singing for my undergraduate experience. I went to Eastman um, and was accepted as a voice major there. Um, Though I did a lot of piano there as well, and that's actually where I became a conductor. So that's a different, another story. You know, interestingly, and I don't know if this is the most most interesting answer I can give, but I studied opera so thoroughly as a as a child, and then in college, and I think one of the main things it taught me is about form and flexibility. Uh, because in opera, very rarely can you sing an opera and just put the metronome on and go from measure to measure to measure like that. There's so much that goes on operatically in conveying a character that requires tempo flexibility, cadences, improvisation, um, expressive gestures, which tend in some ways to be have more latitude than some instrumental things in the modern era. Um, so I just understood, and, and to understand how the voice enables that kind of musical expression, not an instrument, but what the voice is capable of in terms of range, in terms of dynamics, um, in terms of breath, just gave me, I think, a terrific sense with conducting. Um, if you can conduct knowing how voices work uh, and conduct that clearly, uh, I think working with instruments is uh, can be enfolded into that very well. And I mean, simultaneously, again, I am playing piano and playing viola, so I'm, I'm having a very good sense of working with instruments as well. But uh, understanding how to, pro how to hear, I guess this is probably where I'm going, you know, I can hear by virtue of the intensification of the voice, when that voice is going to need a breath, when that singer is going to need to take a little bit more time, how to help that singer through a certain part of the range in the aria. Um, and that just attunes the conductor's ear even more specifically and closely to what's going on even with instruments. So it taught me to hear better, it taught me to hear more within the music. I think young musicians hear a lot 
make the, your instrument sing. Mm -hmm. you know, piano, guitar, violin, wind instrument, flute, clarinet. Make your instrument sing, and the teachers are saying that to them, but it's not exactly clear what they mean when they say right. that, really. And right. the unfortunate thing is that... It's actually one of my least favorite yeah, things it, that people say in, in music. In the result of their performance, you, you don't really hear much of no. a difference than no. if they were just playing it through. And so wh what do you mean by having the voice and having opera as an influence? You know, what specifically does that mean for your musicianship in general and musicianship as a conductor? What are some of the things? Yeah, I think that possible? because the, the voice is has very naturally built into it uh, obviously a lot of capabilities but also certain limitations and is vulnerable to those limitations I'm thinking about range for instance mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know um, now and one can say the same thing about all instruments but let's face it on today's piano if you start at middle C and okay. keep playing all the way up the notes that sound in the upper octaves you don't have to work any harder at those. It's it's not going to be any different. The only thing that's different, of course, is that it's just higher up a few octaves. Um, however, a voice needs a certain sort a certain flow of air and control and support to go into its its upper range, and you can hear in the voice how it's trying to negotiate that transition. Um, so it teaches you to listen very closely to the instrument, the voice as an instrument, and and know what needs to happen for, again, the, the music to take place. You don't take for granted necessarily that it's just going to happen. Yeah. And therefore, I don't take for granted either that a violin is just going to sound all the same going up the fingerboard or that you know the wind instruments um, are going to sound the same wherever they are, whatever kind of articulation. I'm, I'm really listening within to see how the instrument is producing what it needs to produce and how to help it do that. Does, you know, for an instrument to play for an extended period in a certain range, I might have to change the tempo a bit to enable oh, that. Yeah, may have to change the dynamics mm -hmm. a bit or adjust the dynamics of the rest of the orchestra. Articulation. In the articulation, all of those things mm -hmm have to, you know, can serve the cause of making whatever that one instrument is doing or that instrumental section do it as best they can. Yeah. And that, I'd say, I got from singing. Yeah. And uh, I, I would say that every yeah. young musician should sing. In, oh, yeah, in a absolutely. Chorus and take lessons, right. you know, and be aware of what the pedagogy Entails what Absolutely. Are the mechanics of the voice. well, and and by the way, yeah. as someone I am someone who conducts choirs, you know, probably as often as I conduct orchestras, mm -hmm. and of course do a lot of both. Um, so this obviously applies to the singers as well. When I'm standing in front of the concert choir at the Gracias Music Program, as I do every week, um, you know, I need to really understand again, what those voices are capable of and make sure I'm asking them to do things that singers can do, which is how the music sounds best. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that that's, wow, when a conductor has an idea, oh, this line has to do this, but has no sense of whether, whether that's really something singers can do or how to strategize it so it can sound good, whether it's staggering the breath or revoicing somehow. Um, then there's a strain that's placed on the music. The music doesn't work as well. Tempo is a big part of it. Um, I'm always, in spite of whatever I think an ideal tempo for something is in my mind, I'm always adjusting that ideal to match the singers in front of me. The size of the ensemble, the age of the ensemble, the choir, I'm talking about choirs right now, because it's only going to sound fantastic if they're able to sing it well. And of course, the specifics of phrasing and articulation and yeah. tempo vary from style to style and period to period, Absolutely. which is a whole not whole uh, other episode, really. Right. Um, but it's to say that singing is very important to begin with to mm -hmm. form this very vast area. Uh, musical technique. Really. Yeah, and I think yeah. when when I was young, 
every now and then I would encounter, you know, those music masters, the master teachers, whatever, who would say the phrase has to be done like this. Yeah. And I, I would say, um, I would avoid that. I would say the phrase has to be done one of any of these 50 ways. Yeah. But not 60, because there are a limited number right, of right. ways. There, is, so to speak. there are a limit, and there are ways not to do a phrase that are yeah. you know, going to destroy the music, but there are all kinds of possibilities. And I've, I myself have wound up uh, in concert, for instance, taking a tempo or doing things that I was, would never have been convinced of when I first started rehearsing it. Mm-hmm. And then like, oh yeah, this is, again, for this ensemble, in this circumstance, in this acoustic, acoustics have a lot to do with tempo and articulation and phrasing and dynamics. Yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 really going to work. So there are there are lots of possibilities, but you're absolutely right. And then know what aren't the possibilities. Absolutely. And so the two other areas of your musical work as a young musician. Or as a violist, and, yeah, uh, orchestral violist, which mm-hmm. gave you mm-hmm. orchestral experience. A little bit of chamber music as well, chamber but mostly music. I was doing orchestra stuff. Um, and as a pianist, yeah, you know, both solo and as a rehearsal, and opera and accompanist, and right. concert accompanist. Yeah. And, um, how how did those areas support your development as a conductor? Well, one would think I was actually strategizing. To yeah, become a conductor, one and I because I'm covering all the bases. I'm yeah, singing, really I'm playing piano, uh, and then I'm playing an orchestral instrument yeah. um, that's bowed and sustained. Uh, and then I even played a little trumpet for a while. Um, you did, yeah. For, I didn't know for a about year, that. year and a half. I took trumpet lessons. Uh, year and a half, wow. Yeah, in in middle school, which was fun and humbling because it's a tough instrument. Yes. Uh, and you know, I, I took them very seriously, uh, and uh, I would say, I mean, it's just it's just invaluable experience because again, it those instruments were helping me to develop as a musician. Um, was I a pianist? Was I a singer? Was I a violist? As opposed to other things, I couldn't really choose one or the other. I was just I was all of those things, exploring music through all of those things. Again, which I think is supported supported me becoming a conductor as well and um, but they were all they all provided distinctive perspectives into the art of making music into the process of making music um, as a pianist you have to consider of course how to create line without being able to sustain the notes from one to the next and um, it's funny though, because as I'm saying this and I'm thinking about it, I was never really inclined as a as a soloist. I mean, I love solo performance as as part of the art, but even as a pianist, I was always my happiest when I was doing some sort of ensemble work. Mm-hmm. I did solo recitals and things like that, and but I I didn't love that. What I loved and what I especially loved was. Uh, piano ensemble doing duo piano uh, and the like and for four summers I attended a program at Westminster Choir College called Piano Camp for High School Students and it was run by William and Louise Cheadle who were themselves duo pianists as well as phenomenal pianists in their own right and, and wonderful teachers and through them, they introduced me to, you know, what it was to, we did duo piano stuff, we did piano forehand, we did piano six hand, we did two pianos, six hands, I mean, we did four pianos, it was just amazing, and I absolutely love that. Um, So I've always been kind of drawn to making music with others, and and ensemble, and how an instrument coordinates with other instruments, and that is a it's a long path around trying to answer this question of what piano taught me actually was how to you know engage either as an accompanist or as a collaborator or you know both with other musicians and then 
in the role of accompanist, of course, is, is, is how you have the responsibility of keep, make, keeping the music together, hanging it together, providing the rhythm, providing the freedom in many cases, depending on the style, for the soloist to have a little bit of latitude. How do you do that? Um, how, do you, how do you help drive it? The, one of my favorite uh, analogies that I still use to this day, and I feel applies to conducting as well, is when at Eastman, I think it was my junior and senior year, I studied with uh, Bob Spillman, who was still there. And I specifically requested to study with him because he was such a great coach and accompanist and so experienced. And many of our lessons, I would actually, my piano lessons would be bringing singers in and all that and accompanying them. And he once said that uh, accompanying is like walking a dog. Uh, the dog thinks, you know, she's out there just, you know, going whatever way she wants, you know, in any direction, at whatever pace, and enjoying it all, but you're still holding the leash and controlling it in the end. Um, and that's what I learned through playing piano, and that's certainly what I feel as a conductor when doing concertos or working with soloists. Mm -hmm. It's my responsibility to be holding the leash and make sure that the dog the, or the wonderful performer doesn't wander off into some dangerous place mm -hmm. uh, with it. And then viola. Viola was great. Uh, and I'm one, I'm one of those people who has very little tolerance for viola jokes. So to mm. set violin, you got to stop doing uh. this because I'm, I'm sick of your viola jokes. Uh, I'm actually very grateful I played viola, and, and I was not a violinist who turned into a violist. I actually started <clears throat> as a violist, and, you know, there is nothing like sitting in the middle of the orchestra, in the middle of the ensemble, and understanding how the engine works from that point of view. And violas are very much part of that, that engine, and then especially now as a Baroque violist, I really don't play you know, modern viola per se. Um, wow, the impact we have on tuning. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to tune a, a cadence unless you get our, th our thirds where they need to be. Um, so in terms of ear training, in terms of understanding harmony uh, and understanding intonation, and then, you know, just really understanding how uh, an ensemble works, the viola provides the inside out perspective absolutely and that's what i what i got from that and uh so i wouldn't trade those experiences for anything i know you've worked with me a great deal um on how the conductor needs to understand both instruments and even though i play cello mm -hmm. and double bass you still have to have a keen awareness about the elements of working with bowed instruments. Yeah. And so I, I imagine you got that from playing viola. Yeah, and by the way, I, I probably ignored also one of the most uh, important things that has helped me as a conductor and that I can do Boeings. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so, yeah. by the way, um, I now I also love working with good principals and especially a good concert master who can collaborate and even take the burden of some of that just because of uh, limited time or whatever but I can bow any set of parts um, I know how the I know how that works and I also know what it means to create a sustained sound but within a limited space um, and that's what string playing really teaches you yeah. yeah you get this wonderful sustained legato but you got to change the bow yeah. at some point and uh, that bow changes differently depending what period you're in, what kind of bow it's in, what, what kind of bow it is. Is it a, even in the Baroque period, a short, short bow, long bow? Um, I am very grateful to the ability to know how to do bowings. And it also helps me on the podium because if something's going on, I can help the string players strategize by suggesting certain bowings. Another thing that pops out to me that's very basic is that... Oh, Nelly. There you go. 
Another thing that pops out to me that's very basic is that conductors who don't have experience playing a string instrument and don't seek out the necessary education to compensate for it often conduct so forcefully without yeah. a sensitivity to the actual amount of force it takes to play a string instrument. Mm -hmm. And a lot of conducting is about a kind of mimicry between the players and the conductor. And so if the conductor is up there, you know, you know, beating you know, their heart out, so to speak, without a sensitivity for what the players actually need to do, it's very difficult for the players to actually do what they're doing because they have this image there that's supposed to be telling them something and they have to ignore it. So, yeah, you know. players, string players and all players alike, and I'd say even singers are sadly uh, often having to ignore what they see from the conductor mm. because it, it is visually contradicting what they need to do. Yeah. Uh, but string playing is, is a good example of that, that in various passages, string players don't need the conductor um, hacking through the air or jumping up and down or crouching or whatever, <laughs> yeah. um, but can benefit from clearly prepared gestures that follow through with a kind of fluidity and smoothness that reflects the bow strokes, especially when working on string pieces. That helps. And and holding notes. I mean, I, I think, as you know, any time we're at a fermata or at the last note, you know, my eyes are on my players, especially my concertmaster, to see where he is in the bow. Yeah, you're watching the bow. I'm watching the bow. And as yeah. he gets to the tip, I may be letting the sound dissipate. Yeah. But I'm not asking for the sound to do something that's contradicting where they are in the bows or how the bows work. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's really important. And all that goes into then being able to have music making that uh, sounds like it's really meant for the instruments uh, playing it or the voices singing it as opposed to working against those forces. And the result is something that's exponentially more expressive and more musical. I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Fantastic. Well, are there any other remarks you have about your own experience as a young conductor and what you would suggest for a young person, or a young professional, or any kind of professional musician who wants to go and conduct. That is... Um, that's perhaps the next episode. I was going to say, that's a great next episode. Let me be yeah. thinking about that in the meantime. Yeah. Um, and I'll elaborate beyond take dance lessons and explore. Fantastic. Thank you so much. My pleasure.